So I'm going to just um, call names and if you can uh, respond and um, let, let us know everything's okay. So uh, the, the list here, uh, Councillor Becky Kent. Yes, I am here. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Ashley Boas. I am present. Thank you. Uh, Miles McCormack is, has sent regrets, so um, we'll move on. Paul Berry. I, was that Paul? I didn't, didn't hear very well. Paul Berry here? No? Uh, Andrew Taylor. Yes, here. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Milena Casanovicius. You're getting really good, Hugh. I'm here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth Pugh said she would be late. I is she here yet? No? Okay. Uh, Peter Zimmer sent regrets. So we'll move on to Alison Carlisle. No? Uh, Mohammed. I, uh, sorry. I am oh. here. That was Hi. just trouble oh. unmuting. Okay, uh, uh, Alison. Uh, Mohammed Ehsan. Are you here? No? Um, uh, Hugh, this is Molina. I actually just saw an email come in from Mohammed that he won't be able to make it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, right. So, um, and we know Douglas Wetmore is here as vice chairperson. Hello, Listen, Douglas. Thank you, Hugh. And myself as chairperson. And we also are joined, I hope, by Councillor Paul Russell. Are you here, Councillor? Not yet? Yeah, Mr. Okay. Chair, Councillor uh, Russell has not joined us yet, but uh, Elizabeth has joined us uh, at this time. Oh, good, okay. Fine, and um, should I just go through the staff members as well, or so everyone knows who's here? Okay. So David McIsaac, uh, Supervisor of Active Transportation. Are you here, David? I am here. Hello, everyone. Hello, David. Um, Emma Martin, uh, Active Transportation Community Programs Coordinator. I don't Emma? believe Emma's in the meeting. Oh, okay. Uh, Siobhan Witherby, Active Transport Planner. I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Siobhan. Um, Chris Devining is our committee clerk. Andrew, Andrea Lavassi Wood, is she online? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I'm present. Okay. And Alicia Wall, legislative support. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Hello, Alicia. So that's our roll call. I'm now going to proceed to give a land acknowledgement, and I'll just read the wording I've been provided with. We would like to acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. So with that, we'll move on to our agenda. Um, and I have item two, approval of the minutes that were circulated. That's the minutes for July 15th. Um, Mr. Chair, okay. I'll move those. Oh, all right. So hopefully everyone received and read those minutes, uh, at least everyone who was at that meeting. Um, if, are there any errors or omissions from any of the committee members? Hearing none, uh, I'll call for a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move that. Councillor Kent. And we also require a seconder. A seconder. Do we have a seconder? I can second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Mr. Chair, I'll just for just for clarification, because I I feel like I may not have been at the last one, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to actually move them. Is there a rule? Uh, oh, good question. <laughs> it just occurred I, to me, it was like July 15th. I think I was on vacation and I, I just don't know if I joined. Yeah, I, I don't here, so I'll second. I'm sorry, I'm relieved I was here, so I'll, I'll second. And I can move them. Let's be okay. Let's be 
Perfect. Perfect. Just to be on oh. the safe side. Okay, fine. So uh, we need a seconder now. I think Andrew did. I did. I, oh, I'm I, sorry. I, I okay. I'm losing track. Uh, <laughs> so now uh, I'm called a question. All those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Okay. Aye. And uh, any contrary minded? Say nay or raise your hand. Well, hearing none, I'll declare that the motion is carried and the minutes are approved. So number three is approval of the order of business for today and approval of any additions or deletions. Uh, Krista, are there any additions or deletions? There are none, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, and would any uh, member like to move uh, items as additions or deletions? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a motion to approve the order of business as circulated. I need a mover. I'll move that, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ken. And uh, a seconder, please. Melana can second. Okay, Melana. Um, and again, um, those in favor of um, approving the order of business say aye. Or aye. 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 Or raise your hand. And any opposed say nay or raise your hand. Okay. Um, all right. So that's good. Uh, I'll declare that the motion is carried and uh, the order of business is as so circulated. Uh, item four, any business arising out of the minutes? Krista. None to my knowledge. Okay. And similarly to my knowledge and, uh, and Douglas as vice chair, is there any uh, business arising? None here, thank you. Okay. Um, number five then is call for a, for a declaration of conflict, uh, of conflict of interests. Um, so if any committee member uh, feels they have a conflict of interest to declare, this is the time to do it. This is with, with regard to our agenda. Okay, I don't hear any. So uh, again, we will move, um, move on. Um, correct? No conflicts of interest. So number six is consideration of deferred business and uh, there is no deferred business. Number seven is correspondence, uh, petitions and delegations. So Krista, are, is there any correspondence that we need to deal with? There's uh, no correspondence has re been received by the clerk's office. Okay, thank you. And uh, any petitions, Krista? Or, or... Uh, none, as well. none as well, Mr. Chair. Okay, okay. And committee members, uh, this is the time if you wish to bring forward a, a petition. Okay, hearing nothing, we'll move on to item six. Item six is reports, discussions, and updates. And we'll begin with a staff update uh, from uh, Supervisor David McIsaac. David. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've turned off all the videos coming in and mine going out just because of a slow connection here or slow internet, so um, apologies for that. Um, so I uh, just uh, did a little interaction with the group earlier today just to get a flavor for some of the activities that are happening in the AT group at least. Um, in terms of functional planning projects that are, are active right now, uh, we've got the Africville Active Transportation Connections project where we are actually doing public engagement this week. Um, and uh, there's a Shape Your City page that, that has uh, a survey and some information on the project and uh, more information on, on how to uh, participate. 
Uh, Dartmouth North, we have finished the first round of engagement on uh, complete streets planning there. And uh, we're working with our consultants and our internal stakeholders on develops, developing some options uh, to bring to the public and to stakeholders for the next round of engagement that will be in the next few months. Uh, in North Preston, uh, we have we're just about finished our functional plan there. Uh, there will be a bit more public engagement. Um, and uh, the first project uh, for implementation uh, is on the books for next year, and that'll be new sidewalks and uh, new AT facilities on Kane Street. Uh, we are, I promise Councillor Kent, we're going to come back to Woodside Shearwater Functional Plan. Uh, I have a meeting with the consultant next week. Uh, that's to fill that important gap between the Woodside Ferry Terminal and uh, the Shearwater Flyer. And uh, so that uh, will become more of a priority in the next few weeks and, and, uh, and will be going out to the public probably in the winter. Uh, we'll be doing some engagement, more kind of community-based engagement in East Preston. Uh, uh, in, in November. Um, one of Siobhan's projects looking at uh, the Midtown Peninsula AAA bikeway connections uh, is has been kind of on the shelf for about a year now. Uh, it is gathering steam and uh, we have a great consultant on board and we'll be um, looking at engagement in early 2022. Uh, that one also involves uh, the, the Halifax Commons. So we're going to let council or hear and see the the commons master plan first, and then kind of uh, using that as as one of our springboards to finalizing our options in that area. Sorry to interrupt, uh, David. Could sure. you just um, recap what was the name of that project again? The last one you mentioned. Uh, sure, it's called Midtown. AAA bikeway connections and okay, great. Sorry, thanks. It involves, <laughs> yeah, it involves kind of yeah. Okay, cool. And and I'm sorry if if anyone's having any problems hearing me, he just uh, do what Ashley just did there, please, because um, and we will uh, the Almond Street functional plan uh, is almost complete. The report to council is just got to few uh, eyes to dot and that one should be going to the transportation standing committee um, in well if it's not November it would be in December if there is a meeting there but that one's quite close and we have Almond Street bikeway on our list for construction in 2022 next year. Uh, in terms of some of our capital projects for this year, uh, uh, just sort of going down a few of them here, the Wise Road protected bike lanes uh, that also includes some, some, I think, important pedestrian improvements is close to completion. There's still about two, three more weeks of work on that one. Uh, the Dally Oak Local Street Bikeway improvements and multi-use pathway in Selvin Ponds Park is under construction right now. Um, uh, most of that will get built this year, but there'll be some uh, complementary sidewalk projects and a couple of other elements that have been pushed into next year's construction season. Uh, the Lehman Street Local Street Bikeway, which is sort of the top leg of the North End Local Street Bikeway corridor, is uh, is under construction. Uh, like most of Halifax, it's under construction, uh, but it is uh, it's close to completion. Uh, it, we're going to have our first mini roundabout. Uh, at Normandy there. So that will be something that we'll be interested to see how it functions and slows down the traffic and hopefully makes it uh, uh, a more pleasant place to walk and bicycle. Um, we recently finished the new uh, traffic signals at uh, the Oxford Street, at uh, the crossing of Oxford Street at Allen and Oak. Um, what else? Forest Hills Greenway in Coal Harbor was extended from uh, Coal Harbor Road uh, over to uh, Colby Drive. Uh, it's based, it's on Cumberland, but it's an extension of the Forest Hills Greenway uh, a little bit further into that community. And uh, anyway, there's a bunch more, but I guess that is sort of intended to give you a flavor of, of what, uh, what we have uh, gotten constructed this year. Um, 
in terms of looking ahead to next year, that is really what is occupying a lot of our time right now, just sort of seeing which projects kind of meet that or at a design readiness that we can put them in the budget. And uh, we will be going to council with, I think, a preliminary list later this fall, and uh, that will lead into the budget for next year. In terms of the community group led projects that, that we support through grants, um, there's some work happening in Lawrencetown to make some better kind of community connections from the Atlantic View trail out there. Uh, we're working with the Sackville Lakes community group out in uh, Lower Sackville. They've got a really, really exciting project, I think, to uh, to uh, build a multi-use pathway through Second Lake Provincial Park there that will connect uh, from basically First Lake all the way out to, um, to Wingate Drive, kind of parallel to Cobbequid. Just had a presentation on that earlier this week and it's like a lot of Halifax challenging territory but uh, I feel like they've done a pretty good job kind of getting the grades nav uh, down and and uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic facility they're aiming to build the first section of that next year um, the never-ending process of shoring up the salt marsh trail uh, where it kind of goes through uh, Coal Harbor um, is continuing um, and there's been some work, uh, uh, what, what call, we're calling the Portobello Connector. There is this intention to connect the Shuby Canal Greenway out to um, kind of Waverly and, and even Fall River using uh, a corridor along Lake William. So uh, the, the group, the, the Shubanakity Canal Commission working with the Schweppes, Shubanakity Watershed Environmental Protection Society, uh, got a new segment built uh, this year from the kind of Dartmouth side working in. Um, and then just a few other things that are um, happening. Uh, we are, we've got a, we've got a great uh, intern right now working with us, Catherine McClellan. And uh, one of her jobs is responsibilities is putting together some, we're calling them capacity building sessions, but uh, with the, the community groups that operate and maintain some of uh, our multi-use pathways. And so she's uh, putting together some sessions right now just to kind of support those groups with information and uh, even getting them together for the first time in almost two years to kind of share best practices. So uh, there's a needs survey out uh, right now. Um, we've got our, we've almost got all of the pilot uh, active transportation wayfinding signage up now. So we, um, what this is, is, is we worked with, uh, Allison will know about this project, um, worked with Bicycle Nova Scotia to develop kind of a template. And, uh, and uh, we've implemented it on a pilot project. Um, and now there is wayfinding signage on Chain of Lakes Trail, co-branded with the, the Blue Route. Um, on the mainland north trail and on the Sackville Greenway. And then uh, I think in November, some signs are gonna go up on uh, the Vernon Street, local street bikeway and uh, kind of the lower section of the Windsor Street bike lane. And, uh, and then there's also gonna be a Shape Your City survey up and, and other reach, cause we basically wanna know what people think of these. Uh, even do, I will just say, even doing these you know, uh, three or four or five segments has been uh, a big chunk of work. And, uh, and before we uh, expanded across the municipality, we're really interested in what people think and, and we want to make it as effective as possible, but also as efficient. And, uh, and so uh, we'll be looking for your views on those. Um, we have, uh, I think we've talked about this and this committee's seen a presentation on a rural active transportation, rural sidewalk program. Uh, that is pretty close on its journey to council. Uh, I should be a transportation standing committee in November. And uh, what, you know, right now, uh, the way it works is that uh, if, if 
uh, one lives within or owns property uh, within the urban tax boundary, uh, new sidewalks and those kinds of facilities are included as a service, but that's not the case in, in rural HRM. So uh, this program is intended to address that and to um, offer up some criteria for, for how we would select and prioritize projects and also how we would potentially adjust the tax structure to um, help HRM pay for its share of, of new capital building and operating it. So that should, should be seen that in about a month or so. Just a couple more things. Uh, the, got a few education promotion activities on the go right now. Um, as we're opening up new facilities and new facility types, we were, you know, have pretty basic, but I think hopefully effective web pages uh, to uh, illustrate how, how they uh, should work for all users. So an example is uh, there's now a video up that uh, describes how the new crossing of Oxford Street at Allen and Oak uh, should operate uh, for all users. Uh, we're going to have similar information for the Wise Road bike lane. And uh, and again, I'll put, I think I've said this to the group, if, if folks on the committee see other opportunities or other needs around that, our communications group in HRM has been great to help us and, and you know, we can uh, work on other activities that you think would, would help people understand what we're doing and how to use these facilities. Um, uh, the first round of our education promotion grants, a lot of those projects are just wrapping up. I just approved final payments for, for a couple things uh, today. Um, so we are happy to be able to support uh, work that you know folks on this committee included are, are working on, and we have uh, a few more. The the second round we do two rounds of funding every year for the education promotion grants, and the second round closed on October fifteenth. So we have a few more to uh, to award this year. Um, two more things. Uh, we are. Working towards a, a winter 2022 report to council on a shared micromobility approach for the municipality. So this is e-scooters and bike share. And uh, so we, we did some work over the last year or so with a consultant and uh, some public engagement to sort of uh, help guide a recommendation to council on, on how we should, the municipality should to get into the business of, of bike share and what would need to change. So we're, we're hoping to bring some of for, something forward to council in the winter. And uh, I think that's plenty. There's lots going on, but uh, maybe I'll just stop there. And uh, if there's any questions, happy to take those. Um, okay, thank you. you. Oops, sorry. sorry. <laughs> thank you, David. Um, I do have a speaker list here that I'll just go through the speaker list and see uh, if people have comments or concerns or questions, um, starting with Milena Castanavicius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, David, thanks for the report, first of all, and congratulations on a well-executed crossing at Allen and Oxford. Accessible pedestrian signals working great. Uh, it feels a lot easier for crossing than having to go up to Quinpool and Oxford, which highly, highly needs accessible pedestrian signals, but that's not on your side. And um, I'm really appreciating the videos on the HRM websites um, and describing what is happening. Uh, and as an example, Brunswick um, uh, renovations that are going to be happening. So thumbs up on that stuff as well. That's all I wanted to say. Good job. <laughs> okay, Great, Marina, happy you. to hear that. Okay, uh, Andrew Taylor. No, no, nothing at this time, sir. Okay. Um, Alison Carla? Yes, I have two questions for you, David. Um, the first one is just about Almond Street. Um, were you still thinking about putting like a cycle counter um, on that stretch or, or somewhere else in HRM? Is that something that's still on Halifax's radar? <clears throat> Uh, I'll have to check on that one, Allison. We've got, I think folks know, we've got about six of the automatic counters out. Uh, there is one fairly close to Almond Street on Windsor Street up there. 
but um, but if you think that would be worth doing, we uh, I could uh, talk to Mark Neener about that and uh, see if what he thinks about putting one there as well. Um, I think I think it was a visual like putting a visual counter somewhere in Halifax, um, not just the okay. not just the counters that go to. That you can collect data, but that actually show you on the ground um, what the data Real time. are. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked about that, but it's it's just one of those things that hasn't kind of percolated up to the priority list yet. But I can bring that back to the group and and uh, and see what they see what they think. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then the other one, you so you talked a bit about the cycling education or the the. I guess education, active transportation education videos and and stuff. Uh, and I've seen the one at Oxford, and it looks good. Um, I was wondering if you uh, or the AT team were involved in like the unmarked crosswalk um, information that's going out right now. Have you been working with the Have you been working with the communications team on that one? Uh, not our group. That might have been more the, on the the traffic group. Okay. So I'm not really familiar with that one. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Um, Paul Berry. Any, Paul, are you uh, questions or concern? No? Uh, and I guess Mohammed Asan did not join us, is that correct? Okay, Elizabeth Pugh. No, nothing from me. Thanks. Just great job, David. No wonder you're so hard to get a hold of. It's a lot of stuff on your plate. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ashley Bose? No, nothing further to my prior interruption. Thanks for uh, answering my question before. <laughs> okay, Ashley. Um, Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Douglas Wetmore? Thank you, Hugh. Um, I just want to say, sounds like a very busy 2022 coming up. Um, yeah. Really looking forward to a lot of those projects there. Uh, glad that the rural sidewalks project is coming back up again. I know it's been a while since we had that presentation, I want to say back in February or March, but I'm glad to hear that that's coming along. And no, other than that, sounds like a lot of good projects coming up in 2022. Just want to say thanks. You bet. Okay, no, then. thank you. Yep. Uh, and it, it just, you know, I, I'll just tell the group and, you know, with the rural sidewalks, you know, on the planning side and the engagement and, you know, we sort of had a lot of that figured out. And, but what's really kind of occupied our time since then is coming up with sort of options to pay for it and, and, and basically potentially altering some of the tax structure and, and, and that sort of thing. And, that got really complicated really quickly. So um, it will be, uh, it'll be something that that's going to be, I think, one of the more important things to, uh, it's easy to identify the need. And it's, you know, it's pretty, you know, we can also kind of come up with criteria to prioritize and, and that kind of thing. But, but the uh, issue of, of taxation and fairness and, and all that sort of thing has been. Uh, Imagine that's uh, getting you deep down a rabbit hole. It, I've been down a few rabbit holes. I've learned a lot more about <laughs> municipal taxation than I ever thought I would. So, um, so anyway, we'll, we'll uh, you'll see. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I, I do have a one or two questions, but I don't want to uh, belabor it. But, but I have some questions regarding uh, the recent work on Eisner in Dartmouth. Um, what I firstly, like most residents, I was surprised that it happened um, since, as far as I know, there was no consultation with residents. But what concerned me and many other residents was the, um, the fact that the bicycle marking, the bicycle lane marking has a two way bicycle lane on one side of the street and uh, and also which which by the way, I, I feel is 
not as preferable as one on as a, as a one way on both sides of the street. But the other thing was that those bicycle lanes are shown as being for pedestrians as well, even though they're simply marked on the street. And is this a new policy or because it seems odd to me, quite honestly. Um, so, Hugh, are there are there bollards or separating kind will, of measures? Apparently, I've just learned that there will be bollards. So, uh, so it's protected bike lanes, but it's not just bike lanes because they're also marked for pedestrian use as a sidewalk. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, so this, uh, this, go ahead. <laughs> this did, okay, I guess, sorry. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just give you a quick little background and then I'll, you know, be, um, so this project came out of the traffic group, out of the group that does traffic calming. And uh, what, uh, you know, if you haven't noticed, traffic calming in HRM has gone from something that almost never happened to something that is, you know, it's on steroids right now. Um, which I think is positive for road safety and for people walking and bicycling for sure. And uh, so I think that I'll, I'll let, I don't know all the details, but I think that this was a, a tactical project to attempt to kind of narrow Eisner and, uh, and to slow down the traffic that way. And what that is supposed to be is actually a multi-use pathway. So, uh, you know, it's supposed to be a three meter wide facility for people to walk and bicycle. And uh, the pavement markings, you know, I were, they put a bike stencil and a pedestrian stencil down just to make that clear. Okay. Well, my, my feedback on that is bikes and pedestrians don't mix. They, they don't even mix on green belts but they certainly, or greenways, uh, but they certainly don't, aren't going to mix on a, on a, simply on a paved road with, which is just painted. So I don't know whether you're the person that uh, one should complain to or, or traffic services. No, it's not me. It's not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, it, 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 it's coming from the traffic group and, right. uh, and I guess the only thing I would say, point I would make, is that it is tactical. It's it's not a super expensive project, and it's intended to be something to learn from. So, um, uh, so I send your feedback in. I think yeah. it's yeah. important. Oh, don't worry. Your traffic services are going to get a lot of feedback about this. I assure you. <laughs> Okay. okay. Th thanks. Anyway, I, at least we know who to complain to. I guess, Mr. Um, Chair, for the, Mr. Chair, for the benefit of the of the committee to understand sort of what's going on there, do you mind if I offer some comments? Please do. Yeah. Thank you. So um, he was right that that uh, I I I had a sense of what was happening there. There's been a couple of things that have kind of uh, contributed to some of the confusion. I think on a community level. Um, I had posted, and I don't think very many people had seen it, but I had, I had posted something actually on Para's website that there was some traffic calming coming. Um, at that point, um, I understood that, and I continue to understand because I've talked to staff today, and that this is a situation that is a little more complex than just uh, the, the installation of this particular measure. This is, an addre is absolutely addressing traffic calming uh, priorities that, that are, are a result of the data that was collected, that this street ranked high in the need for traffic calming. It's a very super wide open road. So what I've gathered from staff is this is a version of a stop, stop gap approach to deal with immediately with some form of traffic calming. The complication for this particular street is that in in two years, this whole road will be have a repaving project. And we have people in that area who are struggling with crossing the street safely. Those coming down from Russell Lake off the hill on a couple of different streets, because there was no sidewalk on the other side of the road, there was a concern with particularly around um, families getting to the school, perhaps with strollers and walkers. Uh, they had no, ch no, no choice but either walk on the road or cross the street that's a dangerous street to cross. Staff have identified as well 
that this is also a road that already had been identified as, as a road that would be, should be sidewalks on both sides. So they saw this as, okay, there's all these converging pressures. We need to do something. One of the, one of the methods is by putting this kind of, 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 of uh, pedestrian corridor in that is um, definitely temporary in a way that it addresses it quickly, but knowing there's a capital project coming up, they will be installing proper sidewalk and, uh, and curb, curb on that road. As Dar Dave had mentioned, there's also this, the, the need for um, narrowing the street is a very traditional and well, well accepted method for street calming. The complication that has happened is at very last minute, they also added in the crosswalk at Russell Lake, on Russell Lake Drive across the street on Eisner, which then complicated it from a, peer, a perspective of the community. The community was seeing, okay, we really like that. So why now would you need this other thing? And that's where I, as the counselor, I'm like, holy crap, I gotta talk to staff because no wonder this is not being well received on a number of levels. The other piece is the bollards have not gone in yet. So everyone is of course seeing this roadway as being unsafe. Who's gonna want their kids walking where cars could like quite easily be distracted and come over and hit, hit you and or um, bikes and things like that. And it's gonna take time for the public to adjust to a narrowing road. They'll adjust much more quickly when those ballers are up. Having said that, this is a great example of the need for um, us as a group here at this committee to talk about the implications of when there's not a lot of coordination. A lot of great work has gone into this, and better people, more you know, more more qualified people than than myself, and I can only speak for myself, are the engineers who have the latest and most technical approach to traffic calming. We don't have, as counselors, we don't have the authority to engage in that. It is, it is, if it qualifies and if the budget allows for it, then they assess the entire street and all the converging pieces that are creating the pressure and they ident they create this, this, this version of what it's gonna be. Um, they also said that on the trail side of it, they had already identified that, that what they hope to do is create that bike and um, pedestrian path uh, connection all the way to the Greenway Trail. So people can be yeah. on that side of the street and go directly into that Greenway Trail without any crossing at all. Those that are coming from the Portland Hills side and the um, Portland Estates Drive, for instance, that trail that goes to it that way, they'll have to cross, but anyone coming off the hill can easily get down. That's the goal as well. So we actually have a number of things all converging at that particular location that need to be addressed and we're trying to address it in the best we can to get some immediate safety concerns put in place, but plan for further further um, modifications to get to where we need to get. So it's, <laughs> it's and, I, and for me as a counselor and, and you're one of my constituents, it's very hard for me to put all of that into an email and not, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, um, and, and I am collecting all that all that information and working with staff. Staff fully expect me to be, uh, I'm gonna collate it over the weekend, all the, the information that you sent in and many others and Facebook and all that and get it to staff so we can help respond to it and maybe create some question and answers to help people understand what's going on. So sorry to tie up a lot of this, this your committee meeting, this committee meeting with that, but I think this is a good example of how complex some some infrastructure investments are. Uh, what what seems straightforward actually can be quite complicated. So I don't know if that helps you, Hugh. But, yeah. Oh, uh, it helps me. And um, and um, yeah, I, I think um, it, I guess the unfortunate thing was people were blindsided by this. Yeah, and, and, and to speak to that, to speak to that, um, Hugh, and this is good for the committee to know that I have discovered that traffic calming and the data collection, there is no uh, um, layer and, and expectation that, that um, public consultation will happen. There is a framework that is used for our traffic calming um, measures and, and data collection and how we make those decisions. Um, the Transportation Standing Committee 
and uh, through and the department through Brad, Brad has said that there there is a no, new report coming down with potential some modifications to how we approach those things. So that is on my to do list, and I suspect other councillors because we're not District Three is not the only ones that are having this experience where where we, where residents get to put in a request for traffic calming, and if it meets the criteria, and the next thing you know it's on a list, that's it. The decision's made and if the funding's there, we as counselors get to be involved at the at the budget time, but even then we're not sure what's gonna get executed when because that's a, a scheduling thing. So anyway, I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, uh, Councillor Kent. And um, I, I just saw a, a note from David that he's leaving the meeting and rejoining because he's having audio problems. So um, we'll move on, um, I guess, to uh, item 8.1.2, staff presentation uh, on policies and procedures relating to sidewalks, sidewalks and uh, particularly to standards, capital projects and sidewalk maintenance. Um, I have David uh, and Siobhan Witherby as the presenters. Hey, Siobhan, are you ready to go with that? Yep, I can jump on um, while David gets his audio issues okay. resolved, if you'd like. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen here. So Krista, with um, sharing my screen, I can only see sharing of the window of Google Chrome, or I can share my entire screen and just pull up the PowerPoint that way. Should I proceed like that? Give, give that a try. And if you have any difficulties, okay. then, uh, then I can assist. Sure. Here we go. Okay. Can everyone see my screen here? Yeah. Yeah, and if you're okay. if possible, just go to, uh, yeah. to well, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I can't see you guys. If anyone puts their hands up, um, you'll have to let me know. <laughs> but um, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and to the members of ATAC, thanks for having uh, myself and David tonight to talk a little bit about sidewalks in the municipality. Um, we heard that you had some questions about um, the policies and procedures um, of how sidewalks are developed, different standards we have for pedestrian facilities, um, and we'll give you a rundown of some capital projects and um, maintenance. So myself and David, hopefully he can um, jump in whenever he is um, back in the meeting, but I'll get us kicked off. So in terms of the types of pedestrian facilities that we typically provide in HRM, they fall into one of three categories. So we have your sidewalks on street, um, we have multi-use pathways, and we have street to street walkways. I have a table over there on the right that shows the total amount of sidewalks, multi-use pathways and walkways that we have in the municipality. And it's quite high. So it's a lot of um, infrastructure that we are maintaining and we are adding more to that list each year. For sidewalks, it's kind of our traditional pedestrian infrastructure that you're used to seeing. Um, it's alongside the street on one or both sides. Um, grade separated from the roadway, typically uh, concrete, like you can see in the photos there. And it is exclusively for people walking and rolling. Um, you are able to bicycle on a sidewalk if you're under the age of 16, but it's primarily for um, walking and rolling purposes. And the width of sidewalk varies throughout the municipality. Uh, most of our sidewalk is around 1.5 meters, which is the minimum um, standard we have right now. If it's an area where we anticipate there to be a higher number um, of pedestrians moving through the area, we will go to 1.8 meters or even two meters like this, in, like this photo of um, Summer Street alongside the public gardens. That's a little bit wider than normal. And then um, if it's curb abutting, sidewalk, we're not able to put um, a boulevard with any sort of grass or trees, it is a little bit wider. Um, so it's 2.1 meters just to create that um, separation from the vehicles in the roadway. Multi-use pathways are primarily off street facilities. Um, sometimes they are through parks, sometimes they're along rail corridors. Um, sometimes in the urban area, they are alongside the street. So in that top picture is the Halifax Urban Greenway, which is 
kind of in place of the sidewalk alongside one of the streets there. Multi-use pathways can be asphalt in an urban area or they can be crusher dust a little bit farther out. So um, the picture on the bottom is a crusher dust multi-use pathway. That's a photo taken from the Gatesbrook Greenway. And multi-use pathways are meant to serve people walking, rolling, cycling, scooting, skating, um, a range of different modes um, that are human powered and yeah, just get you kind of from A to B. A lot of our multi-use pathways are leading from suburban areas or rural areas into the city and um, connect you into the urban walking and cycling network. The width of multi-use pathways vary. So typically our minimum is around three meters. There are some areas in pinch points where that might be a little bit less, um, but three meters is, is probably our close to our minimum standard right now. But um, what we're hearing from um, Halifax residents in terms of accessibility is that three meters might not always be wide enough um, to create enough um, passing distance between people going in opposite directions. So now we're moving towards providing a 3.5 or a four meter multi-use pathway as a standard, and the maximum is six meters for a multi-use pathway. Talking about street to street walkways, these are typically in kind of more suburban or curvilinear neighborhoods where the street isn't always on a grid. So to create um, a faster pedestrian um, route to get through the neighborhood, there will be these narrower asphalt street to street walkways that help you connect into where you want to go. Typically they are asphalt and they're about 1.8 meters wide. Um, they can be used by people walking, rolling, and cycling in a pinch. There's no rule against it, but um, yeah, you just kind of have to take a look around you and, and beware that um, you are sharing the space. And this photo on the right is what a street to street walkway looks like in the city. Um, they were all kind of built around the same time um, as the municipality was growing. And there are a lot of street to street walkways that are in need of recapitalization. So that's something that we are kind of working on um, within the AT planning group is how how we address some of these street to street walkways because there are quite a lot of them. Excuse me, could I? I just want yes. to, want to interrupt because I, I, there's a message from David saying he's yeah. not getting the opportunity to uh, join as a panelist. Okay. That's interesting. Can, can you fix that? Do you see him in there, Krista? Um, I don't. I don't think he needs to move the slides. I can advance the slides as long as he can kind of jump in and speak. That would be oh, ideal. This is Krista. So David, I am clicking to promote you, and he may have just promoted. At, he would get a, a cue saying that uh, to accept being promoted to a panelist from an attendee, and I think we have him in now. Yes, we do. Okay, sorry to interrupt there then. Please continue. Perfect. No, it's good. We're coming up to his part, so I'm glad that he's back. <laughs> Alrighty, so I've talked about um, sidewalks, multi-use pathways, and street to street walkways. Some other pedestrian elements that we're always considering is boulevards and separation from the street where possible. Um, typically, we would like to have grass and trees in that boulevard um, if there's enough space. If it's if there's not a lot of space and it's under about a meter or maybe even a little bit less, we might consider a hardscaped boulevard with um, some textured um, tiles like along South Park Street in Halifax. We're also looking at accessibility, so adding tactile warning strips at intersections. Um, we're looking at curb extensions, opportunities to bump out at intersections or mid-block to shorten the crossing distance is um, beneficial for people walking and rolling. Also considering um, traffic control, um, for example, pedestrian signals, RRFBs, painted crosswalks, and signage. Um, that definitely factors into how people walk and roll around the community, although it's those, we are, we are involved in some conversations around pedestrian traffic control. It mostly sits with um, the traffic management group. So we focus this presentation on just the um, kind of mid-block pedestrian infrastructure, as you could say. So how do pedestrian facilities get built? Um, in terms of sidewalks, um, sidewalks will get built alongside the construction of any new street that goes in in the municipality. Um, so for example, if a new community is being built, all of the streets, even local streets will have sidewalks on at least one side. 
So that is great. Um, sometimes it does lead to some areas where there will be floating sections of sidewalk. For example, if a new community um, is built and it doesn't link into a, a street with existing sidewalk. Um, so we will try and kind of close up those gaps where possible. Um, also sidewalks are built in when we're retrofitting existing streets. So we, we recognize that our, there are some existing streets in the municipality um, that could use a sidewalk and um, we're working on a prioritization, pardon me, we have a prioritization process um, to help us identify um, those areas where sidewalk would be needed um, from a network perspective and where there's kind of pedestrian potential for high use. Um, we're trying to have the greatest impact on Halifax residents in terms of how we choose these areas where the new sidewalks are built. So there is a tool that helps us to assess that. It's called the new sidewalk assessment tool. And um, basically it looks at the surrounding context around an area. Um, so for example, we get a 311 call um, from a resident or an email from a counselor or any other sort of request for sidewalks, we'll actually perform this analysis that looks at um, things like proximity to schools, daycares, senior centers, um, parks and playgrounds, recreational opportunities, high density residential, um, areas with higher employment or kind of commercial shopping opportunities that would be a destination and a driver for pedestrian traffic. Um, we'll also look at the classification of road and if it fills a gap in um, the sidewalk network and try and prioritize the sidewalks that rate highly using this tool as it will have the greatest impact on residents. Um, we do see a little bit of differences from before amalgamation in terms of what communities have sidewalks and what communities don't currently have sidewalks. We're playing catch up a little bit. So when streets in um, the former city of Halifax and Dartmouth were built, um, they were more likely to be installed with one or two sides of sidewalk. Um, in areas like the town of, former town of Bedford and the county, not a lot of the streets were installed with sidewalks to begin with. So now that those areas have been growing and people have been kind of moving in and wanting to um, interact with their communities in more of an urban way, we're, we're forced to, or no, we're not forced to, we recognize the need to fill those gaps and um, help build sidewalks in those communities to connect into the destinations that people want to go to and kind of improve the safety um, first and foremost, safety and accessibility of getting around by foot and by wheel in those communities. So I'm going to throw it over to David if he's there to talk about um, multi-use pathways. I am here. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so again, multi-use pathways will get built uh, either as sort of an HRM priority. So if building a new connection is, is something that's been prioritized in the AT plan or the integrated mobility plan, they will get prioritized and, and programmed in as a uh, as budget and integration opportunities permit. Uh, the second way is, you know, developers will also build uh, multi-use pathways as part of their developments, sometimes as an alternative to a sidewalk. So um, one example there is is a lot of the, the um, streets in the Bedford West area uh, have been built with um, multi-use pathways uh, on one side of the street instead of a sidewalk. Uh, again, just to provide that that safer bicycle facility as well. And and what we hear actually from the developers and, and people live there is they just they like the wider space. It's just kind of nicer community space to to um to uh, walk around and and to meet people and that kind of thing. And then the third category is is those facilities where volunteer community groups have some kind of license agreement, usually from the provincial government, to um, build and maintain and operate corridors. So the most recent example of that, and you can see the picture there of the group, was the construction of the Gatesbrook Greenway uh, on the eastern shore uh, between uh, head of Chesapeake and almost into Muscadabit Harbor. Uh, and uh, so that a lot of that is the the rails to trails network in 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 the municipality where the province owns the land, and uh, the community group has an agreement with the province to kind of do all the work, frankly. And and HRM's role is is to provide funding and also capacity building support to those groups. 
Um, so I highlight, I talked a little bit about this uh, in 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 uh, in my staff report earlier, but uh, it very much depends. The approach depends on whether it's in the urban tax boundary or in the the rural tax boundary. So right now, HRM financial policy. Uh, what it is right now is is that there is uh, residents in that urban boundary pay 33 cents per hundred um, hundred thousand dollar value of property um, more, and the difference is is really the the service difference that that urban gets that rural doesn't get because of that difference is sidewalks. Um, those rural areas do have some uh, community-led multi-use pathways, and there are occasionally, very, very occasionally, I think only one example in Sheet Harbor where area rates are in place there uh, that have supported the construction and maintenance of, of the sidewalk that kind of goes through the middle of, middle of that community. And there, I've talked a lot about the rural AT program, so that's going to hopefully address that gap. Um, going forward. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a, where some of the money comes from to, to, to do this construction of, of new, new sidewalk capital. So a lot of it comes from the active transportation strategic budget. And uh, so that's, and that's both for new sidewalks and for multi-use pathways, like the the facility that was built uh, between Walter Havel and, uh, and Chain of Lakes recently, and those grants that go to community groups. And so, you know, what we're talking about there is, you know, between two and mil three million dollars a year is more or less been the been the average. It's been a little higher in in previous years, and I don't know it, it stays both steady from year to year. Um, there's another account called Other Road Related Works, and, and that's what we've been using uh, to recapitalize the street to street walkways. Um, I was gone for some of what Siobhan was talking there, but, you know, those we kind of those were a little bit. Um, a lot of those were built by developers back in, you know, the 80s and uh, really did not get a lot of attention from HRM. Uh, a lot of them were maintained, but in terms of recapitalization, very little was done. And uh, we've got a lot of work to do uh, right now to start getting some of those back into a more accessible um, uh, condition. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a big program. It's one of the many areas where we're growing, but, 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 but that's, uh, that's something that we've, we've been working on a lot more in recent years. Uh, the fourth, uh, there's a there's an account called Sidewalk Renewal, and that is that supports rebuilding existing sidewalks that are in poor condition and uh, and need to be recapitalized. And then we also get some investment in uh, multi-use pathways and sometimes sidewalks in kind of project specific budgets. So, for example, all of the work that's happened on Bears Road over the past couple of years. Um, also included a budget for for the multi-use pathway um, that that was built next to it. And if you're a real budget geek uh, and you really want to get into this, uh, that's the budget there, the capital plan. And uh, if if anybody on the committee wants any help navigating that, um, please be in touch. I would be happy to uh, help you uh, get through that document. Um, there is there's a category. If you look at the table of contents, uh, most of of the active transportation money is in something called uh, the roads and active transportation group of budgets. Perfect. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of our more recent capital projects um, in terms of sidewalks. These are our kind of wins from the past two, three years, um, the larger projects. So there's a list here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see through some of our photos that we have been um, building sidewalks around the municipality, focusing on areas like Spryfield and um, like Fairview and 
areas of um, Dartmouth. We've got some that were recently built in um, Timberley to close gaps um, down to St. Margaret's Bay Road. Um, in the photo on the top right there is a picture from Herring Cove Road. We installed um, a new sidewalk where there wasn't currently anything with grassy boulevard, some trees, some nice new bus stops and a um, bicycle lane. So love to see that. And then um, the photo down on the bottom right is of Chadwick Street. So that was just completed um, last year, I believe. And that's a curb abutting sidewalk um, so where we didn't have enough space for the grassy boulevard with trees. The sidewalk became a little bit wider. Also on that list, some flagship ones that are up and coming for Dartmouth um, would be sidewalk on Oak Street from Creighton to Tulip and also on Victoria Road from Dahlia to Thistle. So those were part of the Dahlia Oak Active Transportation Connections project that I'm so fond of. <laughs> um, and it was tendered this year, but um, due to timing, there's just not enough time to build it um, before the temperatures get too low. Um, so they've pushed it and are gonna build it first thing in the springtime to close those gaps. So that's quite exciting. And then some of the recent multi-use pathway projects. Um, David was talking about Bears Road. Um, we've got a picture on the top right that is the Dunbrack Greenway um, from Chain Lakes Trail down to Walter Havel. So that's just a picture that we took looking down the hill from St. Margaret's Bay Road. Great connection there. Um, and we also have a photo on the bottom right of the Gatesbrook Greenway, which has been mentioned as well. Um, under construction right now is a new multi-use pathway in Sullivan's Pond Park, also part of the Dahlia Oak Creighton Active Transportation Connections project that will connect um, the new local street bikeway route on Dahlia down to Hawthorne in a more direct way um, that allows you to use the grade and um, have a more direct route to the Shubenacadie Canal Greenway up to the Dartmouth Common. Want to talk about maintenance, David? Are you there, David, or do you want me to jump in? I'm here. I was just muted. Um, okay. <laughs> just a, a boring technical glitch, not a serious <laughs> one for now. Um, so uh, maintenance uh, would, I guess, fall to our colleagues in, uh, in Transportation and Public Works from the Road Operations and Construction Group. Um, Any time for everything that you just saw on those previous slides that, that has been built recently, uh, there's also, you know, obviously the upfront capital cost, but then for about every kilometer of those facilities that, that get built, about $10,000 per kilometer is added to the operations budget to support, um, mostly to support winter works and snow clearing, but also sweeping, garbage collection, uh, mowing, a few things like that. Um, so in terms of winter works, uh, we're not going to go into, there's some links there. It's, it's fairly well explained on, on the website in terms of the, the priority um, system for clearing and, uh, and some of the guidelines that they use. So uh, we won't go too, too much into that. Um, those were recently uh, uh, changed and, en and enhanced, I think. So, you know, things like multi-use pathways were, were um were uh, increased in priority and uh another element that i was happy was also increased was just clearing of bus stops so um it was kind of ridiculous this personal opinion before that you know bus stops were cleared really almost at the end of the, the clearing cycle but more money was added to the budget and uh and they're going to be cleared uh sooner than they were before um, but those maps or those links will have uh, more information on um, on timelines and categories of streets and, and that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that our colleagues in, in road operations and construction do is they've got a separate budget for kind of more spot repairs, I guess you would call them, of, of, of sidewalks. So, uh, you know, if there are... are um, are frost heaves or are heaving segments of sidewalk. They have, they have equipment that will go in and kind of slice off the, the tripping hazard. Um, and, uh, and then they'll also go in on an annual basis and, and pick off some of the, the, the more 
um, deteriorated sections, um, kind of smaller sections and, and, and rehabilitate those as well. And that's, that's a quick overview. Um, and uh, obviously happy to answer questions or uh, link folks to any other information that, uh, that they're looking for about the wonderful world of uh, sidewalks. Thank you very much, David and Siobhan. Um, I found that very useful. I hope others did too. Um, again, I'd like to go through a speaking list to give everyone a chance to uh, ask questions and write comments. Um, I don't think Mohammed Esan joined our meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. So uh, we'll move on to Paul Berry. Do you have comments, Paul? No? Is Paul still with us? I don't think Paul joined. Oh, he didn't join at all? OK, I, I have him on the, um, OK. A different Paul is here. Yes, we have the, a Councillor Russell has joined us. Hello, Councillor. I hope Hello. Uh, you were able to, to uh, catch the presentation. Oh, I did. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you. And I appreciate uh, David and Siobhan going through it. OK, very good. And um, do you have any comments or, or concerns on that? At this point, I don't. OK, fine. Yep. I can Thank carry you. on down the list then. Uh, Elizabeth Pugh, do you have uh, questions? I don't. Thank you. OK, Elizabeth. Uh, Ashley Bowers? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. OK, Ashley. Um, uh, Andrew Taylor? Not at this time now. I want to look at those maps though, so I will do that eventually. Okay. Uh, Alison Carlisle. No questions, thanks. Okay, Alison. Uh, Milena Casanovicius. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I, I have a I have one question and two comments. Um, Siobhan, first, thanks for the descriptions. Really appreciate it on this end for someone who sees nothing at all. And uh, David for the presentation. Uh, sidewalks are highly important to myself. Um, I'm just curious uh, as for the first question. I think in Calgary there were several years ago that they've put in a law or a mandate or something of the sort that all new uh, subdivisions are to have a sidewalk at least on one side. And I resided in Lower Sackville um, for a couple of years a long time ago where you're going through the cul-de-sacs and someone, someone, someone who's um, blind and or a, um, a, you know, someone who uses a wheelchair, we're constantly contending with the cars that are parked in, in the rural areas. And that's not a safe way to be traveling. So is there, is there anything, I'm not sure if the two of you could even answer that, but is there something that will be put into the municipal bylaws or laws or mandates that all new subdivisions must have a sidewalk somewhere? Uh, uh, David here, Melina. Yeah, so that is the case right now. So that is part of the municipal design guidelines is, is that, you know, as new uh, subdivisions are built, they do need to have a sidewalk on, on at least one side. Um, there, there are, I think Siobhan referred to it, there are those like parts of Lower Sackville, Fairview, um, more suburban parts of Dartmouth where when they were built, they were not, the developers were not required to, to put in sidewalks and that's where we're having to go back and, and retrofit. But uh, as they build new, they are required to, um, to put in sidewalks. Okay, good. Thank you. I, I probably missed that somewhere somehow. And then, um, and then my comment on the multi-use paths, well, I, I think they're great and fantastic for connecting like chain of lakes and parks and uh, so th 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 things like that. Sorry, I'm just here in the chat box there for a second. Um, Andrew, can yeah. you mute your, your mic? It's a little distracting here in the... I, oh. Um, um, I, I was muted, so I don't know what you were. Uh, oh, I thought it. Thinking. I thought I heard you. Sorry, someone's yep. mic is on. Yep. What I think that is 
is the text to speech reading the chat. Yeah, that, that was mine. And that's that's so if we could just hold off when while I'm on before I meet myself, when you're doing the chat boxes, it comes through. And then and that's it distracts me and it distracts everyone else. I'm sorry. <laughs> um so so on the multi-use path, well, I think that they're great in, you know, again, in 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 areas like Chain of Lakes and and uh, um, things like that. The Bears Road is nothing but a monstrosity for, again, people who have disabilities and someone who is blind or partially sighted. And I've I've uh, I've had conversations that I really, really urge and um, Councillor Russell and Councillor Kent in your jurisdictions that in the high density areas, such as where there's shopping and coffee shops, that multi-use paths are not used as replacements for sidewalks. And the whole point of walking on the other on the other side of the street to where the sidewalk is just a sidewalk is, is not cohesive to those of us with disabilities because it leaves us in unsafe crossing. So, you know, we're zigzagging. And again, let, let's just use the Bears Road example. I could, I could walk down where the sidewalk is, um, which would be the north side, I believe, and the south side has the new multi-use path. And as a guide dog user, I'm constantly going in the opposite direction because all guide dogs are trained to be walking on the left and following the trail. So it's very dangerous. And that one in particular is still not wide enough and, you know, enough set up on that. So I, I just wanted to bring that in on the whole sidewalk issue, and particularly that we do have two counselors in here today, if we could remember that to try and avoid them as much as possible. And just to retract just a little bit uh, to, to Councillor Kent's uh, about just the eyes and just to backtrack a little bit. Thank you for that explanation. Um, however, with traffic and with a lot of things that are happening in the city, and again, because the counselors are here, um, safety seems to be put in at the last moment. So those bollards on Eisner, as the chair Hugh said, should have been in first before anything happened on that road. End of thought. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay, Melina, thank you for your comments. Um, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Melinda, for that comment. And I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you on that one. Um, but certainly information I can take to uh, my conversations with staff. How, um, I, I do have a question. Um, I think this probably will go to you, you David, but um, perhaps both. One of the complications, not complications, one of the challenges that we have in all of our infrastructure addressing our, our trails, our our active transportation trails, our pathways, are those that lead to our schools where there is a discrepancy on whose, whose uh, jurisdiction it is. And often the determination that it's HRCC, uh, formerly the school boards, and there is a, a lack of attention and uh, maintenance and snow removal um, and safety concerns addressed at that level. We often as a municipality are being asked to address them. We're often being accused of be not, not taking care of them in, in communities. And I wonder if um, you could help the committee understand the, the, really the challenges that we're facing there. And if we see any resolution in sight, because it's an ongoing issue, and our even where we we can address these pathways and maintenance and snow removal, it only goes to a certain point. And then our students or parents who are traversing back and forth in our communities are then put to a place where it's either unsafe or not cleared, et cetera, et cetera. So could you have, offer some comments on that? David, were you able to hear the question? If not, I can kind of jump in and begin to answer um, from my perspective. Uh, 
Okay, he says that he needs to leave and come back. Oh. So I'll, ha I'll have a run at that, um, Councillor. So I mostly will deal with um, the sidewalk requests for HRM streets leading to the schools. I haven't honestly heard that much about kind of the issue with connections through kind of the parking lots and the parks that lead to the front doors of schools or the maintenance um, associated with them. So is it maintained? Once it's on the school property, it's maintained not by HRM, it's maintained by HRCE. Is that what you're saying? It's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's something I can definitely bring back to David. I don't know um, the, the solution to that, but it, it seems like something that we should be um, integrating a little bit better to make sure that the, the safe pedestrian pathway is complete and cleared and made to the front door of the building. Because if we are kind of making the effort to connect through the neighborhood, we, we need to close, close that gap. I see exactly what you're saying and the importance of it. Um, maybe if I can take some time and follow up with you, um, maybe with, with some so thoughts and ideas from David after, after this meeting, that might be best. I'm not sure if he's been able to get back in. Thank you. Do, David, are you there? Love to sure. chat with <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else from you, Becky? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Douglas Wetmore? Uh, yes, I have two quick questions. Um, first of all, in regards to sidewalks, um, something I've noticed, especially this summer walking around town, um, a lot of the curbs on sidewalks at intersections, I've noticed there's, there's some on Spring Garden that are absolutely fine, South Park are fine, but I've noticed there's others primarily along Oxford, certain um, subdivisions within the South End, that the curb cutouts leading from the road to the sidewalk are incredibly small and almost sometimes at weird angles. And I can certainly imagine that that's difficult for anyone with a stroller or wheelchair. And I'm wondering if that's, I, I see you shaking your head, so I'm willing to bet there, there is work being done on that. But I was just curious if um, that's also part of new policies to have proper sizing so that people can get it on from all angles without having to kind of go in at an awkward angle or go into the street at all. And um, for those curbs that are still relatively small, are there plans to update those within the next few years or does that kind of coincide with as we do work on the main road? David, do you want to have a go at that one or should I jump in? Okay, I'll, I'll start to speak. Um, we're definitely aware of a lot of areas where those curb cuts oh, are not couple. standard and they don't exist. Oh, You're there, David, but it's quite laggy. You've cut out again. Hmm. Mr. Chair, I did provide uh, David a, a note um, I don't know if he, he saw it, but just that he could try calling in uh, as an option as opposed to uh, going through the, uh, the meeting link. Okay, well, if he calls in, please let us know. Um, and we'll continue uh, with Siobhan's uh, response. Yeah, he can jump in um, if he's able to speak. But yeah, we're definitely aware of lots of areas where the curb cuts are very small or non-existent or at those weird angles and not accessible um, by any means. So um, the as David was talking about, the operations group is slowly picking away um, kind of corner by corner at some of the worst um, ones that are identified as um, kind of the least accessible and we're going in and making the cuts wider and adding the tactile strips and putting them at the right angles. Sometimes they'd, they'll fan all the way um, around the intersection and sometimes they'll be a little bit more defined. I feel like we're still kind of working on what that looks like um, and what is the most accessible, um, but it's definitely something that is a huge undertaking in order to try and upgrade all of those curb cuts um, in the city, but we're, we're kind of picking away. And anytime there's a new um, street recapitalization, they'll use that opportunity to go in and fix the curb cuts, um, but it is happening independently of any other road work um, bit by bit. Okay, perfect. Um, the other question I had, or I guess this is more so of a comment, and I don't know if you or David would be the people to talk to, but I opened up the winter operations and services link that you had in your slideshow. Cause I know I had a lot of concerns 
regarding uh, slow cl snow clearance last year prior to me joining this committee. And um, one of the biggest issues I've noticed with snow clearing is mainly a lack of what the standard should be with what is defined as clear and what isn't. And again, I'm not sure if you're the people I should be echoing this to, but I think what would be really appreciated is some very clear standards. Um, I open the link and they do have a photo, but a photo doesn't really say much with um, all the diverse sidewalks and pathways we have throughout HRM. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I'd especially like to see is standards regarding how wide the pathway should be clear. Um, a certain level of ice removal and ensuring that there's no sort of dangerous slippery um, surfaces. And um, most importantly, proper clearance at intersections where um, plows may come by after a sidewalk has been cleared and then push snow back into the sidewalk, causing pedestrians to have to essentially climb over a little mound of snow um, just across the street, especially at um, intersections where there's no proper crosswalk or four-way intersections that can get extremely dangerous. So I would love to see more standards in for those. Yeah, I know. I understand what you're saying, Doug. Um, they ha they seem to have those written definitions for kind of the street roadway, if it's down to bare pavement or if it's like a three meter, four meter um, sort of clear way. Um, but it would be nice. I don't believe that we have that level of detail for sidewalks, um, but I would need to kind of confirm that and follow up with you. I can try and connect you with some of our colleagues in um, Winterworks um, to provide that feedback. David, if you're there, you can jump in. Um, with anything else you might have to add. I'm just going to jump. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to jump in. I, I see from uh, Becky Kent that she has to leave definitely at six o'clock. Will we still have a quorum, uh, Krista, once Becky leaves? Yes, we will, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, jump in there. Did, did you, had you finished, Siobhan? Oh, perfect. I was just finishing up. Um, yeah, and including the curb cuts in those definitions, I think is is quite important towards getting people on and off of the sidewalk and crossing where they need to. Totally. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, perhaps maybe down the road, it'd be uh, if the committee's interested, maybe we could have more of, of a discussion in terms of winter clearance policies for pedestrians, but I'll leave that for a future date. Well, by all means, uh, you can suggest it. Um, for a future for a future meeting and and just as a general point um please uh all committee members if you have particular uh, items that you would like to see on the agenda go in the future uh you should contact myself or douglas and uh and we'll see if it's appropriate that it, it is on the agenda um okay douglas i i if you've finished i i do have one question for um Siobhan or David, and it relates to, um, okay, uh, relates to the issue of a really a sort of legacy um, projects that are now considered or uh, designated as greenways. And the one I have in mind is on Baker Drive. It was required of Clayton Developments. Um, it is not to the current standard in terms of, it's not even three meters wide, I don't think, but more particularly, it was so badly built with no sort of sufficient under underlay that uh, it's already considerably warped um, and up it, heaving uh, along that stretch. And I've talked to cyclists in particular and, and they say they don't, they wouldn't use it. It is so bumpy and so narrow, it doesn't function as, uh, as a multi-use pathway as it should do. So I'm just wondering um, if there's an issue like that, um, how do we get that recapitalized? Uh, who, who do we talk to? Either David or Shiva. I'll give him a second to jump in. If not, I'll go. Okay. He's written something in the chat. He's written something in the chat. He says Baker Drive has its condition assessed this summer. I expect oh. that it will be recapitalized. Oh, well, that's good news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I'll look forward to that, David. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that we, was my... Hmm? That we was wrote my it um, as a group, the active transportation group. We were on kind of a site visit going through there. And yeah, it, I can confirm it was very, very bumpy. So I'm hoping that it'll um, be recapitalized soon. Um, okay, that's yeah. good to hear. If um, I can add to that, if I can just jump in. Um, one of the things that happens every fall is all of the counselors get in touch uh, with all of the departments around HRM. And we talk about the things that people tell us. Um, so if you don't have a more direct link to get in touch with anybody at HRM, get in touch with your counselor. And uh, we will be able to uh, at least identify that. Uh, doesn't guarantee uh, anything about a time frame or, or whatnot, but it at least gets it uh, put up for consideration. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, let's uh, move on then um, to, uh, since time is running short, um, we I, item 8.2, uh, committee members, uh, there's no uh, uh, item there in terms of committee membership. So number nine is added items, and we did not add any items to, um, to the agenda. Number 10 is date of next meeting, and the date that's set is November 18th at the usual time, 4.30. However, um, this raises an issue in terms of whether the committee wishes to meet in person or uh, virtually uh, or some hybrid um, where some members might want to be uh, in person and others could call in virtually. Um, the other committees apparently um, have um, gone to polling members uh, privately, anonymously, uh, to see um, their preferences. And I believe, uh, I, I know I've talked to um, Douglas and Krista about this, and I believe Krista will be contacting you individually uh, to see your preferences with regard to future meetings. Um, so, as things stand right now, uh, I could I cannot tell you whether the next meeting will be in person, virtual, or a hybrid. Um, and I, 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 rather than than ask people to discuss this out uh, in, in the open right now, it's best if this is done privately uh, or anonymously. Um, and I hope you agree with that approach. Okay. So um, is that right, Krista? <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. I'll be reaching out to members for the next meeting. Uh, I just wanted to, I've had a message from Councillor David Hensby who wanted me to pass along to you and the rest of the members that he's been watching on the meeting. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I just, hope... He just wanted to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I hope Councillor Hensby uh, was happy with what he saw. <laughs> Um, so yes, so you'll be in contact with uh, with committee members at, um, sometime soon, presumably, Krista. All right. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, the item eleven is adjournment, and I need um, someone to move adjournment. No seconder is needed for that. Move to adjourn. Oh no, that would do it. Okay, thank you very much. We have a mover. Uh, no seconder is required, so I will call adjournment to the meeting and thank you all for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you all. Okay.